Hi, I'm Ken Falls, your candidate for the Acton Agudo State Unified School District Board of Trustees. And yet here's another one of my exciting, ever so exciting campaign videos. Today, we're talking about fact check, which is different than check into cash. Well, maybe, I think. Listen, what I want to talk to you about today is there was a candidate for him earlier this week. Uh, two of the three candidates for this office were able to make it. Uh, we started by opening up with our candidate statements. Then there was uh, some questions from the town council that held the forum. And then uh, there were questions from the audience. Now during my section, uh, the sitting board president really didn't have a question. He stood up to make a comment. And his commentary started off with uh, characterizing uh, one of the other candidates as a ghost, a ghost. I'm not sure whether that was appropriate, but whatever. And then he took after me, uh, taking exception to some of the things I was saying, and said that they needed to be fact-checked. Uh, some of the concerns I've raised is, we've gone from a precarious fiscal place a couple of years ago, and I think the word I used was uh, teetering with financial insolvency. And just so you know, this is teetering. Okay, that's what teetering means. Uh, next thing was I was concerned that uh, given where we've been and given the, that the charter expansion hasn't really been legislatively or legally validated, um, that that might not be too solid. And if we become too dependent on that money and there's a challenge, then we find ourselves back where we were two years ago uh, with a brand new high school to maintain and some other things. So. Um, I said that I thought uh, that there weren't good indicators that this was over because there's still an active lawsuit and uh, there was some contention about that. And then finally, I was concerned that when you lose one student here and the $8,500 that goes with them in funding, that you have to sponsor 27 students out there somewhere at a 3% cut to get that money back in with each, just like the one student in our district that we're responsible for educationally and, and all that. Out there, you've got kids way out there, a lot of them that you don't know, you don't know who they are, and you, you, ha you have a moral obligation to, uh, to educate them uh, and not just take the money. And then there may be some liabilities to go with that, and I specifically reference special education. So, uh, as far as the candidate forum went, there's going to be a link below. Uh, watch it, uh, see what everybody had to say. Uh, and hopefully that will help you make your decision and how you're going to vote. But let's get back to this fact check. I really want to start by having a look at the board president's comments. And let's do that right now. As a city school board member, I need to be careful because I don't want to interject myself into an election. I'm not up for, for election. I'm not running. Um, we have three candidates. One of them is a ghost that we've never seen. And we have candidate. So as far as I'm concerned, this is an effectively a, a two-person race, and it, it needs to remain that way. Uh, but Kent knows I kind of serve as a fact checker uh, on his articles and stuff. And because you are preparing to vote and make decisions on your candidates, and those decisions have to be yours, and it's certainly not within the purview of the board to be telling you who you should be voting for or anything else. That's a decision you are all are ample, more than ample to make yourself. But as a, as a few checks go, I, um, I have to say that Ken and I will just have to be in disagreement on this. The district was never in, or even close to receivership. Uh, that was a never an issue. Uh, he used the term, but we were, uh, we were never there. Uh, the lawsuit is in fact settled, and there are no pending lawsuits. Um, and there was a concern that Ken brings up that could otherwise be valid about uh, when we authorize charter schools, who's responsible for all the kids we don't know that, that are in far off places. Uh, the district has a MOU that is the sister to every charter. So we have a charter agreement, which is the main contract, if you will. And then we have an MOU. And the MOU indemnifies the district from anything that a charter school or any of the kids within those charter schools would do. Um, it's, it's the only business model that makes any sense to indemnify and protect the district from anything that a charter school might do 
and um, not all charter school authorizers have MOUs associated with their districts. Is there a question? So, but we here? do. There is no question. Oh, no, okay. Please. I thought this was no, the last question. I know question. you would like to have a question, but there is no question. I'm okay. simply it's all right. Out. This time I'll have the last word, Mark. Go ahead. I, I'm simply pointing out that um, there, there is no issue associated just back with, just with make it's just a, uh, the fact that well, we are immunized from anything that a charter does or anything that the kids would do. All right. Thank you, Mark. Actually, Okay, there's the board president's comments. So to frame them very briefly, first off, he's saying the district was never into receivership. I'm saying teeter at, teetering at insolvency. So I'll give him that. We'll just we'll call it the same thing in, instead of playing wordsmith. And in his place, it was never close. In his mind, it was never close. Uh, that there are no lawsuits. You heard him. There are no lawsuits. They've all been settled. And finally, uh, that the MOUs or, or these agreements they have with, those, with the charter schools indemnify the district from any liabilities. Um, so let's start off with the first one. Was AAD USD ever really teetering with financial insolvency? Here's the evidence I have. Okay, we're fact checking item one, which again is. I've said in my candidate statement that the district has teetered at financial insolvency and has made a dramatic recovery uh, using income from a vast expansion of charter schools which have yet to be legislatively, uh, legally validated, much less understood by the, the people in the district here. That's you, the taxpayer. So, we're going to look here at this. FICMAT report, Fiscal Crisis Management Assistance Team, Los Angeles County Office of Education, uh, is a fiscal review of the Acton Aguadosa Unified School District, September 10th, 2014, about two years ago. And so, if we go into this document, we find right here, the county office changed the district's 13-14 first interim budget report from a qualified to a negative certification indicating that the district is unable to meet its financial obligations in the current or subsequent fiscal year and then there's an educational code you can pursuant to another educational code the county superintendent appointed a fiscal advisor in january 2014 to ensure that the district meets its financial obligations, the fiscal advisor is authorized by the county superintendent to perform any or all of the duties required of the county superintendent, including staying or rescinding any action that is inconsistent with the district's ability to meet its financial obligations in the current f subsequent fiscal year. Now, I was in the board meeting where I've been for the last five years. Uh, the gentleman's name was Dick Douglas. He sat through the meetings, also went into closed session, and the board was powerless to do anything financial that would affect the district's uh, fiscal situation in a further negative way. If that isn't close to uh, insolvency or teetering at the edge was the quote I made. I don't know what is, but again, the board president is saying, not even close, end quote. All right, there's the evidence on insolvency. I don't know how close you are to receivership or insolvency when you've got somebody from the outside, from an appointed governmental a regulatory agency sitting in your board meetings and telling you what you can and cannot do financially. That's not a good place. So, next thing we're going to look at is are the lawsuits really settled? Let's have a closer look. Okay, we're doing fact check on number two in the case that the board president says has been settled. So we're here at the appellate courts case information from California courts. I'm going to hit refresh up here so the page comes up again because it tells you uh, the time and date of the status of things. So let's wait for that to come up. 
And it says that the information was last updated 10-23-2016 at 2.20 p.m. That's today, about 45 minutes ago. This is the docket. It tells you what's happened. So if the case was settled, it would tell you at the end it's settled. Uh, but it's New Hall School District versus Acton Aguadose Unified School District. It's in Division 3 of the 2nd Appellate District. And the case number is, write this one down, B26. 7856. What this case is, is it's the remnant of New Hall suing Acton Aguadose when they opened a school in their boundaries. Uh, uh, Judge Chalfant uh, said that uh, that charter petition and hearing wasn't legal. So instead of closing the school, he left it open. New Hall was declared the, the prevailing party, and New Hall, instead of uh, uh, letting this go on and spending even more attorney fees from their kids' uh, uh, district funds, appealed it because they wanted the school closed until there was a legal charter or one that had been run through a legal uh, hearing process. Uh, so what this is, this case is now actually Newhall seeking attorney fees up to the point where they prevailed in the case. So, again, uh, this afternoon at 2.20 p.m., uh, let's look at this docket, 10-28-2015. Uh, that's when uh, this first uh, thing popped up, and when we go down the list here, there's all kinds of activity this spring, 2016, uh, April, May, uh, June, July, August, and now we're into last, uh, it says 9-26, 2016, letter from respondent, Acton Aguadosa Unified School District. So the point here is, if this case is settled, why is it still on the docket? One more thing before we leave this page. I want you to notice that when we click on parties and attorneys, I want you to see this name right here, Gerard and Edwards. You see that? Gerard and Edwards. Now let's go on to the next document. Okay, now next in our fact check, we're looking at warrant registers from school board meetings. This one is from Thursday, June 23rd, 2016. And if we look, do you remember that name? Gerard and Edwards, attorneys at law. Now there's another attorney up here, Fagan, Fulfrost, and Freeman. And we follow that through. They were paid a little over 29000 And I know from personal experience that that firm uh, does collective bargaining for the school. It uh, does special education cases. And in rare occasions, uh, responds on behalf of the superintendent when someone wants the public documents that aren't wanted to be handed out. I'll talk to you about that one later. But anyway, here's that name that we saw on the court docket. Gerard Edwards, attorneys. And there's that number. $27,368 for legal fees, April and May of 2016. Moving ahead, now we have the warrant register for Thursday, October 13th, 2016. A school board meeting as we flip back to here well there it is again Gerard Edwards attorneys $23,400 legal fees for July 26th July 2016 I'm sorry so point here is over a couple months we've paid the same attorney firm that's on the docket a little over $50,000 for a case that's been settled. If it's been settled, why is it on the docket? And why are we paying attorney fees? Alrighty, on the lawsuits, once again, we the case is still on the docket. And we're paying attorneys $50,000 at a time in the last couple months. On cases that are still active, even today. That doesn't sound settled to me. Finally, let's look at this one, MOUA, indemnification. So kind of what you have to think about here is, again, one student, $8,500. One leaves here 
you go out and you sponsor 27 kids at 3% to replace the 8,500. Now, as a sponsor of the charter, uh, you do have some liability that goes back to it. Now, I've got an idea. Why don't you lend me your car? Because I don't have a car. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write you this piece of paper right here, and I'm going to say if anything happens, you're not liable, I'm liable. Remember, I don't have a car. I probably don't have much money or whatever I have. But anyway, that's okay. So I go out, I get in an accident, I run through something and hurt some people. Those people come back and they come to you, the car owner, and they say, I want, your, I, I want to be recompensed here. I'm damaged. And your friend there uh, who did this with your car doesn't have any money. And you say, oh, no, here's this piece of paper right here. See, he's come. Really? Do we really believe that? So at the end of the day, how much are we really indemnified? especially in the special education areas, especially if we're the ones supplying the services and then charging the charter school for it. Once again, let's look at my evidence. So again, we're going to go back to the Fiscal Crisis Management Assistance Team that the Los Angeles County Office of Education uh, did on uh, the Actonagua OC Unified School District on September 10th, 2014. And again, this was when the district went into negative certification. On page one, right there, we find this. In an attempt to increase revenues, the district has approved several charter schools from which it collects oversight fees and which it charges for extra services, including, in some cases, special education services provided to the charter school as a school of the district and then there's an educational code again my question is if I'm worried about special education liabilities and you're saying that you have an MOU that protects us taxpayers back home from that type of situation with kids out there that we don't know and never will see how can we be held not liable if we're actually the one providing the services and charging for them so there it is, the fact check. So this piece of paper right here is going to protect me from everything and I have no responsibility for my uh, legal issues that could come with a lot of faces out there that we don't know, 27 for every one that we lose here. So at the end of the day, here, here's really the bottom line. I expressed a concern that the rampant charter expansion over the last couple of years was the result of dire fiscal circumstances that there are still legislative and legal issues to be addressed that could jeopardize uh, where we stand. And the bottom line there is, is if you lose the charter money, are you right back to where you were? Call it financial uh, brink of insolvency or receivership or whatever word you want to spin on it, but that's where we were. We can have another a fiscal advisor assigned from a regulatory agency sitting in our board meeting again. It's nothing I want to be a part of. So. Is there any evidence that says that those things are real, that those challenges are real? Well, when somebody says the case is settled, and I've just shown you it's not settled, it's still on the docket, and we're kicking out $50,000 over a couple months to the same attorney from that's listed on the docket. Come on, what's real? What's not real? And, and why not just tell us, isn't it time for the truth? And then in the end, are there other hidden liabilities that go with this? And that, and that third one was, you're telling us that you have no liability, that the piece of paper protects you, but yet you're charging for special ed services that the district is providing. How are you protected from that? And I get input from people I, I see and, and some people that were talking in the forum that there's an increase in number and some problems in the charter special ed program. So bottom line is this. When I have concerns, I express them out in the open. I don't have to be right. But I don't expect someone to stand up and call me out and, and, and kind of insinuate that I may not be telling the truth. Uh, people that know me personally know I've got a really good moral compass, that I'm transparent, I'm honest, I'm diligent about things. And um, I hope you'll watch the candidate forum video. Again, there will be a link below. And um, I hope that helps you make your decision. And I hope that you will seriously consider uh, voting for me, uh, Ken Falls Graf on November 8th. Thank you.